This is Pastor Alexander McBride once again coming to you from the First African Baptist Church located at 601 New Street, downtown Beaufort, South Carolina, right behind the Chocolate Tree on the corner of King and New Streets. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Sunday School lesson as presented from the Boyd Sunday School book for May 8, 2022, titled Hope for the Future and the international lesson, Freedom for the Future as studied from Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. But before we get started, I do want to wish every mother, single or married, happy Mother's Day. And do invite you to come on out to FAB and worship this Mother's Day with us, starting at 11 a.m. All and everyone are welcome to come on out. I would also like to remind everyone that we have started face-to-face -face worship and Sunday school services. Our Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. and our formal worship Service starts approximately 11, 15 a.m. each Lord's Day. We start on time so we can get out on time. Also, just to let you know, my personal office hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if there's a need to sit, meditate, talk, counsel, tour, pray, please come on by. And also, I'd like to remind you that we have Bible study each Thursday evenings. We have prayer from 6 to 7 p.m. and Bible study from 7 to 8 p.m. each Thursday. We started our new series in Bible study in the book of Revelations. In our sermon series each Sunday, we have started in the Gospel of John. Come on out and ask any question from or about the Bible and we'll seek out the correct answer from our Bible. May I also remind you that with the help of Second Helpings, and other contributors to whom we say thank you so very much. We are still distributing food from our food pantry at our education or parsonage located on the corner of Prince and New Street next door to the church. Each second and fourth Sunday from 12 noon until resources are depleted. The only prerequisite that we have is that you have a need, help us to meet your need and follow the instructions by the distributors for their safety as well as your own. Thank you all so very much for your sacrifices and your faithfulness. Having said that, my beloved, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for loving us and keeping us and being our God. We come before your throne in humbleness, bow down heads and open hands, Lord. We have nothing to bring but ourselves, and we offer ourselves, O oh Lord, as a living sacrifice unto you. Father, I ask that you forgive me of my sins and the listening audience of their sins, Lord God, and help us, even though we are diverse in numbers, help us to be unified in Christ Jesus. 
Lord, I thank you for today's Sunday school lesson and the Mother's Day that's approaching us swiftly. And I ask that you would bless each and every mother, uh, single or married, Lord God. Help them in the name of Jesus to be what you have called them to be in these last and evil days. Now, Lord, as we study our Sunday school lesson, give me eloquence of speech, bring to mind all those things that you have taught me, and help me, O oh Lord, to explain with clarity, love, and also uh, faithful strength, Lord, and then help those that are listening to include myself. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, O oh Lord, and when we know better, we see better, we hear better, help us, O oh Lord, to do better. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen and amen. All right, my beloved, let us read from the King James Version, Romans the 8th chapter, starting at the 18th through the 30th verse. This promises to be a very good lesson. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have uh, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why do he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for he know not what, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good, for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. May God add a blessing to the hearers and understanders of his written word. Now, our own sister Latoya Mack, after our tradition, will render the Lord's Prayer and Song, and afterwards we will find out where we can find hope for the future. Sister Latoya Mack, sing, daughter. Our Father, who art in heaven,
All right, now, my beloved, wasn't that beautiful as always? Sister Latoya, I do always appreciate your ministry and song, and I thank you for who you are and what you do. God bless you, daughter. Now, in today's lesson, I'm going to get right into the context of it, okay? I'm not going to really get into much of an introduction, but let's put it in context as far as this is concerned. Now, the Apostle Paul was involved in, in, in several important mission trips, and the last of which was his trip to Rome for a hearing before the emperor. And we're talking about Nero. The, the book of Acts ends with Paul awaiting his trial, Acts 28 and 30. And Rome was a destination he wanted to go to. He desired for many years to go to Rome. And you can find that backed up in Romans 1 and 13. But be careful what you ask for. And not necessarily in the status of a prisoner. He got to Rome, but not the way he thought. I believe he was going to get there. But God had plans of, uh, of his testimony, not only to the Romans, but to us today. So the letter to the Romans includes Paul's understanding of the Old Testament background for the Christian message. The nature of Christian salvation based on the atoning death of Jesus Christ. The centrality of faith as the only path for human salvation. The relationship between Christians uh, of Jewish and Gentile backgrounds in the plan of God and several other matters. Now, all this makes Romans both the most challenging of Paul's letters to understand and the richest depository of what he calls my gospel, Romans 2.16 and then 16.25. The basis and reality of being justified by faith is the subject of Romans 1 through 4, chapter 1 through chapter 4 in general, and specifically, particularly chapter 3, verse 24 and 28. Paul quoted Habakkuk 2, 4 in Romans 1, 17 to set the tone for the entire book. What did he quote? The just shall live by faith. And this means uh, that faith, Complete trust in Jesus is the only way that eternal life may be found. It cannot be earned by obedience, although obedience is important. It is not inherited by ancestry, although this is not unimportant. True life, eternal life, the life of salvation is only found in trusting God to save us through his son. Faith alone. Abraham, the great patriot of the Jews, was justified by faith, according to Romans 4 and 3. And he was quoted in Genesis 15 and 6. Thus, the idea of faith in God as the core element of one's life is not a Christian innovation. Such faith is to be the foundation of our relationship with God. Let me say that one more time. Have a drink of water. Excuse me. Such faith faith in God alone, such faith is to be the foundation of our relationship with God. And this was intended as central in the pre-Israeli period during Abraham, in the nation of Israel itself, as read in Habakkuk, and it is also now for the church also. In Romans chapter 5 through chapter 8, Paul lays out the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection. Through Christ, the reign of sin and death has been overthrown by righteousness and grace, Romans 5.21. With the reign of sin and death defeated, believers are free. New life in Christ also means freedom from bondage to the law, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Now, Romans 8 brings these various elements to a climatic resolution. There is now no condemnation. And that's a legal term, no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ, Romans 8 and 1. What the law failed to do, God himself has done through Jesus Christ, 8 and 3. Righteous living is enabled by the Holy Spirit who dwells in those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Is Romans 8 and 9 said, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Amen. So people saying that uh, that just kind of uh, uh, wipes out that second blessing thing is uh, uh, being saved is not enough. 
If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And it's not through an evidence of speaking with tongues. It is not through any exterior evidence as such. It is evidence by how you treat people about your righteousness. Are you doing right about people? Don't tell me you can speak in tongues and in language of angels in one breath. And in the second breath, you cuss me out. And the Bible said, can bitter and, and, and sweet come out of the same fountain? Of course not. Of course it can. All these wonderful truths, however, raise a painful question. Why? Why do suffering and death still wreak havoc on us? Paul indicated the likelihood that Christians would suffer for Christ's sake. Paul encouraged the Roman believers to keep the big picture in mind. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 17. Keep the big picture in mind. Keep the right perspective in mind. This is not our home. We're just passing through and in passing through, People will violate you. People will hurt you. People will slander you. They're going to do all these things. So when they happen, don't think it's something strange. God had already told us these things will happen. Not only will happen, but must happen. So let's look at it. Let's get into lesson 818. For I reckon, and that's a word of thought, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul was trained. He was a school recipient. Paul was trained by the respected Jewish teacher Gamaliel. That's Acts 5.34 and 22 and 3. So for Paul to reckon something was for him to draw on both his faith in Christ, which is good, and his vast knowledge of the scripture. We are to have faith, but we are to have it balanced with knowledge. Knowledge not of society, not of things around us, but knowledge of scripture. His thoughts are not to be taken lightly. Paul was careful to put the sufferings, whatever the cause of these sufferings are, of this present time in the proper perspective. You may be suffering ill health. You may be suffering heartache because of the loss of a loved one. Whatever you're suffering from, keep the proper perspective. Jesus' resurrection initiated a new era of salvation and restoration. And because God's faithfulness to his salvation promise has been revealed, according to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, suffering of any kind pales in comparison to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Forms of the word glory occur here and in Romans 8, 21, further defining what believers have to anticipate. The faith of suffering ends with, with being glorified with Christ and with all who have traveled the same path. Isn't that good news? My, my, isn't that good news? Yes, sir. So, having said that, we can look forward to great expectations, can't we? Verse 19, for the earnest expectation, the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Let's look at that thing. Creature here, you can just translate it as creation. Creature includes anything and everything God has made. Okay? Here it refers to the entire created world with the exception of the sons of God. While the adoption of believers is a present reality, this fact can be obscured by the troubles of living in a sinful world, can it? The sufferings that result from our fallen world can further conceal the reality of redemption that is already present. Verse 20, first part. For the creation, the creature, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same. Now, following Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden, God cursed the ground as part of the human's punishment. And through no fault of its own, creation was thwarted from flourishing and made subject to, uh, subject to vanity. Now, a lot of people say this subject to vanity could be taken to refer to Adam as a reason for the curse rather than to the power behind the curse. And that would be an error. Although the thinking uh, 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 behind the supposition is sound because humanity was to exercise wise rule of creation, the fall revealed that people were not up to the task as a natural outcome of humanity's foolishness, creation suffers. If caretakers fell into sin and were no longer capable of exercising proper dominion, however, 
in context, and that's how you have to keep it, in context, it is clear that God is the one who subjected creation to futility. Amen? Second part of, of verse 20 and then into verse 21. In hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In the midst of the curse, God made a promise. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Creation despite its suffering, has reason for hope. Yes, we do. The crushing of Satan's head was good news, not only for all who put faith in Jesus, but for all of creation. The bondage of corruption further defines the vanity. Since human sin resulted in creation's fallen state, only when the liberty of the children of God is finally and fully gained will the creature be released from the curse as well. And this Greek word translated glorious can be interpreted in two, two types of ways, as an adjective to describe freedom or as a noun standing on its own. And the second option would explicitly refer to believer status as being glorious rather than experience a glorious liberty. This goes beyond restoration to a fulfillment of God's plan for people. The fate of creation is inextricably tied to God's fulfilling his promise to those who have been adopted into his family. He said, for we know that the whole creation, verse 22, groan and travail in pain together even until now. Now this Greek word translated travail can refer to the intense pain of giving birth. Childbirth is painful to say the least, but the healthy infant who is born brings a Immediate joy to the mother and the father. The analogy captures a common first century Jewish belief that as the salvation of God drew near, conditions in the earth would worsen progressively like the contractions that get worse and worse until finally the baby is born. And I'm here to tell you today, my beloved, the baby is due. Portions of Daniel chapter 7 and 9 help shape this expectation. Jesus also spoke of the difficulty of the end times, both concerning the events that were near at hand and others that will continue until his return. You can get that in Matthew 24 and John 16 and 1 through 11 and 31 through 33. His disciples continued to speak of the troubles that would be seen before Jesus' return ended this age. All that pain, through though, is meant to result in joy for the world. It is not a vain struggle, my beloved. This is something that's promised, and God is not a liar. And not only they, verse 23, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan with our, within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now, look at this first fruits concept. First fruit as a concept, it comes from the Feast of Harvest, also called the Feast of Weeks. And the people would make sacrifices to the Lord of the first grains they gathered. This expressed thanks for God's providing the harvest and confidence that God would bless the people with bounty throughout the harvest season. And like the first fruits of a harvest, the indwelling of the spirit within believers is a kind of down payment, guaranteeing what is still to come. Amen. So what does it say in Ephesians 1.13? It says this, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Okay. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, our earnest money, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise and glory of God. Amen. We have been sealed with earnest money, with the Holy Spirit in our foreheads, for the redempt until the redemption of this body. Now, look at this adoption. Adoption in the Roman world differs from our laws and customs. One common scenario would involve a wealthy Roman man who had no sons. 
He would adopt a promising young man from a poor family, paying the natural father for rights to bring the son into the new adoptive household. This adopted son would be groomed to take over the family business, continue the good name of the adopted father, and become the adopted father's heir. Such adoption is seen in the history of the Caesars, who frequently adopted a nephew or other male to inherit their title. A good example includes Julius Caesar. He adopted Gaius Octavius, who was later called Caesar Augustus, and Augustus' own adoption of Tiberius. Adoptions such as these were familiar to everyone in the Roman world, but especially to the residents of Rome itself. And although believers are already children of God, we still await the redemption of our body, victory over physical death. Isn't that good news, my beloved? Verse 24 and 25, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why do he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Christian hope is not wishful thinking. It's not anticipating a probable outcome. It is assured because hope is based not in our own faithfulness, but in God's faithfulness to his promises. Still, we see not what we hope for, because in that case, we would no longer require hope. When Paul declares that faith, hope, and charity abide in the last one, charity is the greatest in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 13. It is not because faith and hope are dubious of dubious value. Instead, it indicates when faith and hope are realized in heaven, we will not need faith and hope anymore to anticipate our promised future. But love will abide forever. It will still be required even in heaven. God has given us every reason for confidence, which gives us the patience to wait for our hopes to be realized. So my beloved, fret not. He will wipe away those tears from your eyes. Didn't he say so? Now here's where the comforter comes in. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The state of this world can leave us so completely horrified that we are left speechless sometimes. And sad enough, we're becoming used to the horror. Our infirmities, our sicknesses include every piece of evidence that we live in a sin sick and dying world. But when we know not what we should pray, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit steps in on our behalf. And this comes as no surprise since Jesus promised the Spirit would be uh, uh, his disciples or comforter in John 14, 16. Paul built on this, giving believers confidence that the Spirit maketh intercession for us. And when words fail us, the Spirit never fails us. Groanings is the noun form of the word to groan in Romans 8, 23. This context, context, context suggests that the Spirit's intercession also happens within, inside of us. This is supported by the fact that creation does not speak in language, but does groan in its brokenness. Look at the tornadoes, the floods, the earthquakes, all of these things are happening. We live in a broken world. 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's key, key part of that verse. He that searcheth the hearts refers to God. Note that like Jesus, the Spirit only speaks according to the will of God, John 14, 10 and 16, 13. Though we may not always pray according to God's will, especially since we don't know what the mind of the Father, Son, or Spirit is, nevertheless, the Spirit will only intercede in keeping with God's plan. And what is the plan? Verse 28, as we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Even the darkest night of the soul does not mean that we're cut off from God. Paul had an unshakable faith that all things are under the control of God, that all things work together for good to them that love God. Faith is the sovereign God Faith in the sovereign God means believing that he is in control of everything. 
even the evil in our world that causes the sufferings of righteous people is not beyond God's control. Our problem is that of limited perspective. Only God can see how all things work together for good. The question about suffering then is not why, but how long. The why is because of human decision to turn away from God. The question can only be how long, how long would the suffering continue until my soul is flooded again by God's love and comfort? Huh? So not the why, but the how long. For whom, him, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, while doctrines of foreknowledge and predestination are important to consider, Paul's letter precedes by centuries debates about these terms. It does not address the arguments that future Christians would engage in. Rather, Paul's point is that God is working within a plan. That's the point, my beloved. Get to the point. The point is that God is working within a plan, not haphazardly, not throwing people or events uh, together in some sort of cosmic or salvific experiment through chaos or chance. Though chaos or chance may seem to rule the day, we take comfort that the Lord knew us long before we accepted the call to join him in his ultimate purpose for people to be conformed to the image of his son. This is both a new creation and a recreation for to be made in the image of Christ is to be restored to our unsolved state of having been created in the image of God. And as the first to rise from the dead unto glory, Jesus's body resurrection made him the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1.18 because of his resurrection, we expect to be among many brethren who will also return to life promise of our own resurrection is the ultimate hope we have in the middle of our sufferings, my beloved. It ain't going to last always. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Although elaborate and confusing doctrines have been offered to explain the concept of predestination, it is a rather straight idea as presented by Paul, the word translated predestinate in this context means that God has made an earlier decision about our futures. This predetermined plan has three stages. First, God has called us, given us the opportunity to respond to the gospel of faith. Second, a positive response that leads to being justified, declared righteous through our faith in Christ because of his sacrifice on our behalf. And then the final stage is our being glorified when our own resurrections take place and we join Christ in heaven for all of eternity. My beloved, we have a hope for the future. Christians have a hope that persists through the ordeals of life. Outside of faith in Christ, this hope is not possible. Still, we observe and we experience suffering. Focusing on these things make a person nearsighted. Only with an eye on our future glory can a Christian not only endure hardship, but also thrive in the hope of God's promises. While we hope for the glorious future in Christ, we still have work to do. Though our minds turn to evangelism, and rightly so, these verses remind us that we also have a responsibility to all creation. God has made us stewards of his good earth. While people suffer, all creation suffer also. And likewise, believers, peace is the peace of the world. Our glory will be the glory of creation. We wait in hope for the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. And may we as people who have died with Christ and live again in the spirit be beacons of God's wonderful intentions for all creatures, great and small. Oh, Father, please help us view suffering through the perspective of faith. Teach us to depend on your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your son who has purchased our freedom in this in, 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 in Jesus' name we pray, the church of God say amen. Now remember this, my beloved. God is working all things together to accomplish his perfect will. Amen and amen. Until next time, my beloved, the vet Coram Dale, live for the face. I pray 
The pure 